And so I want to introduce Mr. Liam Stewart. Good afternoon, everybody. Father told me to slow down. People has trouble understanding my accent. So I'd like to uh, start off with thanking Father John for the invite, and Father Leon and Neil. Um, the, the people here are very like the people in Ireland. Make you feel very welcome. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a privilege. I've been to Medjugorje 33 times. And before I talk about our Blessed Mother, I need to give you a bit of uh, where I came from and what I'm about. Um, I'm a psychotherapist, and my son just says, take away the word therapist. <laughs> Father Leon the vouch for that, and, and Neil, the good-looking the good -looking fella down here. But on a, a more positive note, I'm the oldest of six boys, and I grew up in an alcoholic home, and first memories ever as a child of seeing my mother drunk and um, seeing all the disturbance that alcoholism does in a home, destroys families, destroyed children. And I've seen things growing up that I should never have seen. And there was nothing to constant rouse my whole life. And my mother was really, really ill. And my father was the only Catholic who kept up the faith uh, my father's two younger brothers, my uncle, are twins. One's a priest, and the other's a Franciscan monk. He's now retired. The priest passed away when he was 32. I didn't get to know him. He was a, uh, apparently a great, great priest. So after growing up in the home that I grew up in, when you're up all night, uh, when there's fighting and everything, I'm going to school. I can't learn at school. I can't concentrate. Um, and it was just, I was in the slow learners class from primary school right through to secondary school. And I left when I was 15 years of age, uh, no education. And, um, and I'm dyslexic. And, uh, well, I used to be dyslexic, but I'm, I'm KO now. <laughs> Love that. But. Um, I thought I, I swore I would never uh, drink alcohol, and I drank alcohol at f uh, 14, uh, 15 was really bad, 16, ended up in a treatment center when I was 21, and the denial I was in was a uh, shocking denial, and I teach the 12 steps, um, because the 12 steps is all scripture, and that's what I teach, and um I opened up my own charity. You call it Heal the Hurt because I believe in addiction. When you start to heal the hurt, you start to stay sober. And there's many definitions of sobriety. Sobriety is a, a life as constant thought of others and how we meet their needs as to how to live a sober, well life. So when I was drinking, it was all about me 24 7. Alcohol comes in bottles, alcoholism, the ISM comes in people. And I as am as I self me. And our Lord tells us, deny yourself, lift your cross, and follow me. So at 21 years of age, I'm in a treatment center. And I'm, I'm married about a year. I got married when I was 20. And um, I stress this because it needs to be stressed. I, I, I did not hurt my wife or children. I destroyed my wife and children. My addiction really got really bad. I found myself then in a mental institution. I was locked up for three months. Um, swore like everybody else, I'd never drink again. Got back out again. Stayed uh, off the drink, not sober. And I relapsed again. And I found drink and then I found drugs. And um, I hated the taste of alcohol, but I loved the effect. Alcoholics don't drink for taste. As people who don't drink can't understand the way that I was drinking once I started, I can't stop. And I can't understand how social drinkers 
have a gla- half a glass of wine and, and then leave half of that. It doesn't make any sense to an alcoholic whatsoever. So I ended up in a treatment centre again for the second time. I was 26 years of age. And by this, uh, this time, I had to uh, destroy my marriage. I brought shame to my wife. I brought shame to my wife's family. I brought shame to my mother and father and my brothers. And um, back in the mental institution again for the second time, was, I spent seven weeks in there. And that's, I thought, that's it. I'll never drink again. Back out again. I relapsed again. And this time, I was really, really bad. My wife had enough, thank God, and she thought enough of herself and our three children that she packed up one day and she was gone. I was a binge drinker. I could be away for four or five, six days. And no one would know where I was. Or, and there was no phones back in them days. So any of my children could have been really ill and they couldn't have, they couldn't have contacted me. But my wife left and she was never coming back. And it was a great decision she made. When I was left now on my own, uh, I, I kind of had nobody to answer to anyway because I was living a single man's life, drinking, drugging, uh, fast cars, fighting, parties, just the reckless life. Back in then, uh, for the third time in the mental institution, I was locked up for two weeks. And uh, at this stage, I wanted, I wanted to end my life. Um, I just wanted to die. I couldn't love. It was just too hard. I struggled. And um, I got back into a treatment center, and they, they said to me, this is the last time you're getting a chance, Liam. Uh, you've been here three times. So I got sober, and I got clean when I was 28 years of age. And a day at a time, I've never relapsed up to the day. And um, I was four weeks sober. And my mother and father broke up on Christmas Day after 30 years. And there was violence in the home. The house was nearly burned down. It was just not nice. And, um, and I struggled big time when my mother left. See, I'm the oldest of six boys. I always tried to win my mother's love and affection. And I believe she favored my two younger brothers. That's the way that I felt my whole life. But... Um, I thought nothing worse could happen my mother leaving on Christmas Day. It's something you'd see in a film, but she did. She left on Christmas Day, and uh, I was like a child trapped in a man's body. Really, really uh, grieving my mother. So I thought that was the worst thing that happened. And a younger brother, he was in uh, a problem with drink before me, and he was an Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was speaking to him, and he says, I'll be back. He's back drinking again. He says, I'll be back and I'm ready. Uh, My brother died two weeks after telling me that. He was only 28. Uh, He left a wife and four young children. And that was the hardest thing I ever had to cope with. I cried every day for two years. I was sitting holding his clothes and smelling the scent of his clothes. And I was totally broken. And don't forget, my mother and father had their own stuff going on. So... Parents weren't available at that, at that particular time. Um, so the miraculous thing, when we buried our brother, me and my father, my father never drank or never smoked. After the funeral, everyone expected me to go drinking. Everybody, but it didn't. And me and my father got in the car and went 100 miles away at another brother who was in the car who had to get his ear and hand sewn on and ate brain damage. And we didn't know how that was going to turn out. So me and my father slept in a double bed together. And I really got to know my father for the first time. And he was saying what it was like for him, married to my mother. And then all his sons going down the same path. He was heartbroken. So growing up in that childhood, there was no God in our home. And then I went to Alcoholics Anonymous and I heard old timers saying, your loving Father in heaven. And I was full of resentment. I was saying, where was this loving Father in our home when we were growing up? He didn't make any appearances in my home. So I'll say it was an atheist. And then that's only a half truth because when I used to be drinking, I used to say a lot of things about God. It must be a big place up there. All the nonsense 
And then at night time when I was on my own, the light was out. I was kind of scared then in case God would come. So after, after that, um, I got sober and genuinely I got, I got clean. And I got stuck in the Alcoholics Anonymous program, which is all scripture. And um, I had to watch the rest of my family uh, continuing to drink and destroy themselves. And I had a younger, the next younger brother, he was a street drinker. And he was just a tortured soul in his life. He poured gasoline over himself and set himself on fire when he was only 15. He was just a tortured soul. And he always says he just wanted to die. And um, he used to be getting beat up all the time. And I used to say to him, you need to stop the drinking. What about you're doing to your uh, mommy and daddy and stuff? Um, and my sponsor pulled me. And it was the biggest lesson I've learned. I'm, I'm 30 years sober. And the biggest lesson, he says, Liam, you need to love your brother unconditionally. The way Jesus loved you unconditionally. You need to meet your brother where your brother's at. And that was the biggest thing I ever done. And I looked after my brother the best I can. The only house he would come to was my house because I would let him in, clean him up, give him a fresh bed, a bath and something to eat. No, no judgment whatsoever. I found him dead in bed. At, uh, he was 35. And this time I'm into my prayer. So he's lying dead. He'd been dead for, for a while. And I got on my knees right away. And I opened up his hand. And I put my hand in his hand and I knelt down and I said the serenity prayer, even before I cried. So it was conditioned in the prayer. And uh, we buried him and, and laid him and laid him to rest. My, my mother and father, you can imagine, buried their two sons, was totally, totally devastated. And my mother continued to drink and her drinking was getting worse and worse and worse. I used to take my father when I got sober. I used to take him on four or five holidays a year. We used to go to Lanzarote and stuff. And we got quality time together. And my mother phoned me after a few years and she says, would you take me to Lanzarote? And I says, mommy, everywhere you go in Lanzarote, after you get a meal, you get a free drink. There's no chance am I taking you to the uh, Lanzarote. And she says, no, I promise on that. She says, I swear on the Bible on that drink. I said, Mommy, you're doing that 30 years. No, no chance. The brothers thought it was a good idea, but they wouldn't come with me. So after a few weeks, after telling her no, and she says, I'll swear on the Bible, she says to me, I've a ticket to Lanzarote on that drink. After a few weeks, I says, what about Medjugorje? Because I knew my mother needed a cure. And uh, she says, I think that's a great idea. So we went to Medjugorje. We got a wee room, two single beds, a wee locker in between us. Uh, I walked up the big hill that the father was on about, Father Leon, and and uh, I walked up in my bare feet for one brother died and walked down in my bare feet for my other brother who had a life of more sin. And I always tell people I'll not be doing it again. Coming down was, oh, telling you. So that night, I was up five o'clock in the morning doing the walk. I get into bed early in Medjugorje. My mother's sitting reading the book, her glasses on, and I thought this is what I always wanted my whole life, a bit of quality time with my mother, and I fell asleep. In the middle of the night, I thought I was having a dream. I heard this voice in the distance was saying, your father is this, and your father is that, and your father. And I thought, what a place to have a dream in Medjugorje, such a holy place. And opened my eyes and my mother was there and she was full drunk. She was down and robbed the, the fridge down the stairs and drank everything in it. And uh, it was a real, it was messy. It, was, it wasn't good. And she drank for the full week. She was totally never left. She just drank for the seven days. But I got her down the field the next day and I said, you promised me. You promised me you wouldn't drink. Do you know what she says? I promised you I wouldn't drink if I went to Lanzarote. I could have drowned her in a pool of holy water, and that's the truth. Um, I took my mother the second time to Medjugorje. She says, I think her blessed mother wants me out again. And I thought, God, I hope it's just not happening. I finally took my mother out. and I had only one week in my whole life with my mother, a quality time, and it was that week. And she never drank. She didn't ask for a drink. 
And we went to the Oasis of Peace, which is in Medjugorje, and my mother loved it. But as you, anybody's been there before, outside, at every language, silence, 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 silence. So I told my mother, when you go in here, you can't speak. She says, that's okay. We go in and we sit down, my mother, there's a nun in front of us, and my mother went to speak to me. I thought, I'm going to kill her when I get her outside. And uh, she kept doing it again. I thought, right. So I got her outside, and I says, Mommy, what do you not understand? You're not allowed to speak. So this is what she says. She says, Liam, our Lord on the cross looked down at me twice. Did you not see he turned his head on the cross? And I knew to back off. And I says, Mommy, that was for you. You hold on tight to that. So I found my mother dead then. After she came back from Medjugorje, she was 65. I found her dead on the sofa. And um, I'm not going to undo it. It was a horrible, horrible, horrible way she died. But we, we, we buried her with dignity. We buried her two brothers with dignity as well. And then her father got, uh, got sick. He had dementia. And he was sick for five years. And thank God we were sober. We looked after our father every night in the home. And we put him to bed. And through the grace of God, we were there when our father died. So you can see the brokenness and the tragedy and everything I went through. But there was good news to that because I got remarried. I married 15 months ago to a beautiful girl in the faith. And she's, just, she's my rock, my, uh, my wife, Claire, a beautiful human being. And we got married. I always wanted to get married in Medjugorje, but there's too much paperwork. So we got married in Derry, and then we took the wedding dress and the suit, flew to Medjugorje. Father Leon got us booked in. Where did he get us booked in for a mass? In the Oasis of Peace, where my mother seen Jesus. So we got our we got a mass in there, got our vows, went to Blue Cross with Father Leon, got photographs taken, and then we went and had a wee reception, and it was amazing. So we, 33 times. When you go to Medjugorje, for those who haven't been there, when you go, the first thing the priest will say, anybody who's here today, it's been an invite from her blessed mother. No one comes to Medjugorje without an invite. And I was just reflecting earlier how many people is listening to this today who haven't been there and are already, our, our blessed mother already has your name down for next year and going again. And that's where my healing, a lot of healing, healing taking place with all the tragedies. And that's where my healing takes place in Medjugorje. Even during COVID, when everything was closed down, we were still flying to Medjugorje and going through the mountain roads and the back roads and there was nobody there and that was all shut down. Father Leon was there, so that was the, uh, a good part of it all. So my recovery today is all through our blessed mother. The first shrine I ever went to was Medjugorje and I've been to Lourdes and Fatima and, and Knock and everywhere, but Medjugorje is where my heart is and always is. Um, just, well, I'll finish with this here. Um, not that long ago in prayer, our blessed mother showed me through my two younger brothers dying, my mother dying, my father dying. Our blessed mother let me see clearly that she said, Liam, I had my arms around you all the time. And I truly believe that. Thank you very much.